In this video, we're going to discuss the financial requirement as it relates to UK fiancé visas. As an OISC regulated UK immigration law firm that has helped thousands of partners, we're well placed to help. If you're preparing and submitting the application yourselves, this is certainly something that you want to focus on, as the financial requirement is the most common cause for visa refusals. In this video, we will focus on two important aspects of the financial requirement. 1. The level of income that you will need to satisfy the financial requirement and 2. How you can calculate you or your partner's income in accordance with the immigration rules. The calculation of the income is something that is particularly important because the way in which your income is calculated is not something that is always necessarily intuitive. So, how much income will you need to satisfy the fiancé visa financial requirement? You must first ask yourselves whether the sponsor, the UK partner, receives any of these, whether that is on behalf of their child or not. If the sponsor does receive one of these, you'll be glad to hear that you must show much less income that is ordinarily required. This is because the adequate maintenance test applies. For more information about the adequate maintenance test, I would recommend reading our adequate maintenance test guidance on our website, migrate.org.uk, where we break this down step by step. Since it's only a minority of applications where the sponsor receives one of these, however, when discussing the financial requirement in this video, we will assume that the sponsor does not receive any of these permitted benefits. If the if the sponsor does not receive one of these, the starting point is that you must show that your gross annual income, the income before tax, is greater or equal to £18,600 when you submit the online application. This is known as the minimum income threshold. I use the word starting point because the minimum income threshold can vary if one, dependent children are also applying, and two, cash savings are being included in the financial requirement. Let's first discuss dependent children and their impact on the minimum income threshold of £18,600. If there is a dependent child or dependent children who are also applying, the minimum income threshold of £18,600 will be increased. I tried to stress the word applying because dependent children who are British citizens, have settled status, or are not applying, will not affect the minimum income threshold of £18,600. This table shows the minimum income threshold based on the number of dependent children applying. If you apply with two dependent children, the minimum income threshold changes from £18,600 to £24,800. It is also worth noting here that if you apply with dependent children, you must also satisfy separate requirements in relation to their application. We discuss these additional requirements in a separate YouTube video. When determining the amount of income you need to satisfy the financial requirement, you may also consider the question, are cash savings being included in the application? Cash savings can 1. meet the minimum income threshold alone, 2. be combined with other sources of income to meet the minimum income threshold, or 3. be completely disregarded if another permitted source of income satisfies the minimum income threshold alone. We will provide a step-by-step -step account of how you can calculate cash savings later on in this video, but it may be worth noting here that £18,600 in cash savings will not meet the minimum income threshold alone. Rather, this table here shows the required amount of cash savings based on whether dependent children are applying or not. Here, you can see that £62,500 is required to satisfy the minimum income threshold alone when no dependent children are applying, and higher if dependent children are applying. The reason why these figures are much higher than simply having to have £18,600 in cash savings is because, as we will discuss, since cash savings is not inherently an income, the Home Office caseworker will follow a formula to calculate a gross annual income equivalent figure. So that was a discussion on how much income you will need to satisfy the financial requirement. Let's now discuss the various sources of permitted income that you can include, as well as how to calculate that income. Sponsors employment income. The first step is to identify whether the employer is a specified limited company or not. This is important to know because if the company is a specified limited company, the requirements, calculation and required documentation will change. The first thing to note is that a specified limited company is not necessarily the same as a limited company. Whilst the specified limited company will always be a limited company, a limited company will rarely be a specified limited company. Okay, so let's break this down. A specified limited company is defined in the immigration rules as 1. A limited company that is registered in the UK and 2. The person whose income you are relying on is an employee and or director of that company and 3. The applicant, sponsor or family members of the applicant or sponsor hold shares in the employing company and 
4. Any remaining shares, not including the applicant, sponsor or family members of the applicant or sponsor, must be held, either directly or indirectly, by fewer than five other persons. I try to stress each of these ands, and this is because all of these need to be met for the company to be a specified limited company. For example, if the company is not registered in the UK, it is technically not a specified limited company. If the applicant, sponsor or family members of the applicant or sponsor do not hold shares of the employing company, that company is not a specified limited company. If shares are held but there are not fewer than five other persons who hold the remaining shares, it will not be a specified limited company. If you're still not sure whether the employing company is a specified limited company or not, we break this down in greater detail in part two of our three-part common mistakes video series which can be found on our YouTube channel. We will now discuss non-specified limited company employment income in the UK. Only the sponsor's employment income and not the applicant's can be included in the fiancé visa application. And this is because of the immigration rules which states that the applicant's employment income can only be included if they're aged 18 years or over, they are working legally and are in the UK. Therefore, as shown in this table, in your immigration journey towards the applicant obtaining indefinite leave to remain, otherwise known as permanent residency, the earliest stage at which the applicant can include their employment income towards the financial requirement is in the second F. FLRM spouse visa extension application and this is because it will only be until the first FLRM application is granted that the applicant can work in the UK legally. Non-specified limited company employment income can either be included under category A or under category B. Category A and category B have different requirements, require different documentation and calculate income differently so you must know which category you will be relying on. This is the case even though the online application form does not reference either category A or category B. If the sponsor will have been employed for six months or longer by the current employer, they can apply under category A or B. Category A is the more straightforward approach. So if the sponsor will have been employed for six months or more when the online application is submitted, first consider category A. If the category A calculation is met, feel free to ignore category B completely. If, however, the sponsor will not have been employed for six months or longer when the online application is submitted, that income can only be included under category B. We will first discuss category A, which is the category for including non-specified employment income in the financial requirement. If you're considering including your employment income under category A, the first thing that you must identify is whether the sponsor is in salaried or non salaried employment. This is because salaried and non-salaried employment are calculated completely differently. The salaried non-salaried distinction is not always clear cut but I'll do my best to try and explain here. Salaried employment typically involves being paid a fixed basic amount per year such as £25,000 per year. It is also commonly the case that salaried persons in their contractual agreement can earn bonuses, overtime or commission. Non-salaried employment on the other hand typically involves being paid by the hour or day, for example, £15 an hour or £300 a day. Like salaried employment, non-salaried employees may receive commission, bonuses and overtime. Pay slips are often very helpful when determining whether the Home Office caseworker is likely going to determine the employment to be salaried or non-salaried. This is an image of a salaried monthly pay slip. Here we can see the basic monthly pay of £3,213.46 and a bonus of £1,466. The basic pay for salaried employees tends to stay the same month after month. This figure only changes when the employer gives the employee a pay rise or pay cut. The bonus figure here, just like overtime, tends to vary month after month. Here is an example of a monthly non-salaried pay slip. This pay slip clearly states hourly pay, and if you see the other pay slips that cover the relevant financial period, it will be clear that the monthly hourly pay received varies considerably. Before we discuss the calculation of both salaried and non-salaried employment under category A, it is important to note that the requirements and calculations slightly differ if the employed sponsor is based overseas when the online application is submitted. Importantly, sponsors who are based overseas when the application is submitted will also need to provide a job offer in the UK. That job offer must also satisfy the financial requirement, either alone or combined with another source of permitted income, if that employment income is to be included towards the financial requirement. The following will relate to where the employed sponsor is based inside the UK when the online application is submitted. I'll now discuss two different methods that you can use to to calculate the gross annual income for salaried employment under category A. The first method is the quicker and easier way. The second method can be ignored by 99% of partners. If the first method equals or exceeds the financial requirement, feel free to ignore the second method completely. Method 1. 
multiply the lowest total monthly pay as seen in the pay slips covering the six months prior to submitting the application, including basic pay, commission-based pay, overtime, bonuses, payments to cover travel time, and skills and UK location-based allowances. By 12, if monthly pay slips are received, or by 52, if weekly pay slips are received. For example, we gathered the last six months pay slips, and it is this pay slip here which shows the lowest total gross pay of £4,679.46. Since it's a monthly pay slip, we multiply this figure by 12, which results in a gross annual income of £56,153.52. Therefore, as long as the application is evidenced correctly, £56,153.52 is the figure which can be used to satisfy the financial requirement. So you may be surprised to see that we ignored the net pay figure and that we ignored any of the deductions here. This is because, as is normally the case, the employer pays the employment income directly to the sponsor's bank account and does not pay the sponsor cash in hand. The Home Office is only concerned about the gross figure here. Being paid cash in hand is one of the many smaller considerations that we have to consider. And we can discuss this, along with more of the other minutiae of the immigration rules in a separate video. So if you want us to create more of these kinds of videos, like the video, subscribe, and all of the other stuff YouTubers say. The second method involves the following. Step one, multiply the lowest basic gross pay as seen in the pay slips, which cover the six months prior to submitting the online application, by 12 if monthly pay slips are received, or by 52 if weekly pay slips are received. This figure will then be the gross annual basic salary that can be included towards the financial requirement. Step two, total the overtime, bonuses, commission-based pay, payments to cover travel time, and skills and UK location-based allowances, as shown in the pay slips that cover the six months before submitting the application. Step three, divide the figure that you reached in step two by six, and then multiply this by 12. And then step four, add the figure you reached in step three with the figure reached in step one. The result of following step four will be the total amount of salaried employment income that can be included towards the financial requirement. Let's now discuss how to calculate non-salaried employment income where the sponsor is based inside the UK when the online application is submitted under category A. Step one, after gathering the pay slips which cover the six months period before the submission of the application, total the gross amount received. Here, you can include the standard basic pay, for example, the 15 pounds per hour, overtime, commission-based pay, bonuses, payments to cover travel time, and skills and UK location-based allowances. So, for example, here you can see a table which shows the six monthly pay slips which cover the six months prior to submitting the application. The total gross monthly pay, as seen on the six-month pay slips, totals to £17,000. Step two, divide this figure by six, regardless of whether the pay slips are issued monthly, weekly, or daily. Continuing from this fictitious example here, £17,000 divided by six is £2,830. £33.33. And, and then finally, step three, multiply this figure by 12. £2,833.33 multiplied by 12 is £33,999.96. This is therefore the amount of non-salaried employment income that can be included towards the financial requirement under category A. Let's now discuss category B, which is the category that is used for some sources of non-specified employment income. So when will you need to know about category B? Category B is for sponsors who have 1. Been employed for fewer than 6 months when the application is submitted or 2. Been employed for six months or longer when the application is submitted, but do not satisfy the financial requirement under category A. So if the sponsor satisfies the financial requirement under category A, just ignore category B, as I'm sure that you have much better things to do than spend time learning about requirements that don't apply to you. Another thing worth noting is that sponsors based overseas when the application is submitted can also include their employment income under category B, but again the requirements vary slightly. Since only a small percentage of sponsors are based overseas when the application is submitted, this video will discuss the calculation and requirements as it applies to sponsors based in the UK when the online application is submitted. Sponsors who wish to rely on category B must satisfy two different tests. Both tests must be satisfied to include employment income under category B. The first test is that the gross annual income that has been received when the application is submitted must equal or exceed the financial requirement that applies, which is £18,600 for most applications, but this will be higher if there are dependent children applying. In the first test, you can only include employment income from current employers. You cannot include employment income from previous employers. The gross annual income calculation varies depending on whether the employment is salaried or non-salaried. If the employment is salaried, multiply the most recent payslip that will be submitted prior to submitting the application by 12 if monthly payslips are issued or by 52 if weekly payslips are issued. The calculation involves a few more steps if employment is 
non-salaried. First, you must total the employment income the sponsor received since employment started up to a maximum period of 12 months. Second, you must then divide this number by the number of months if monthly payslips are issued, weeks if weekly payslips are issued, or by the number of days if daily payslips are issued since employment started up to a maximum period of 12 months. For example, if the sponsor receives monthly payslips and has been employed by their employer for four months when the application is submitted, divide this number by four. And then finally, step three requires you to multiply this figure by 12 if monthly payslips are issued, 52 if weekly payslips are issued, or 365 if daily payslips are issued. The figure that you reach at step three here will be the amount of non-salaried employment that can be included towards part one of the two-part test. As we discuss in our in-depth financial requirements article on our website, migrate.org.uk, you can combine cash savings as well as other sources of income with part one here. The second test requires the sponsor to have received the level of employment income required in the 12 months prior to submitting the application. So gather the pay slips which cover up to the 12 months prior to submitting the application and then total the gross amounts received. Just like part one of the test, you can include basic salary or pay, bonuses, overtime, commission-based pay, payments to cover travel time, and skills in UK location-based allowances. And unlike part one of the test where only current employment income is relevant, you can include employment income from previous employers. Okay, so there are a few other things to note about part two of the two-part test. Firstly, whether the sponsor is in salaried or non-salaried employment is irrelevant here. Secondly, the sponsor does not need to have been employed for each of the 12 months prior to submitting the application. In other words, there is nothing necessarily wrong with there being gaps in employment in the 12 months prior to submitting the application. And finally, with regards to category B, there is no minimum length of employment that is required. So technically, a sponsor can meet the financial requirement by only relying on one week if they receive weekly pay slips, or one month if they receive monthly pay slips, if they're a particularly high earner. For example, Mary has been employed for only one month in the previous 12 months. She receives £240,000 a year as a surgeon, and her first monthly pay slip totals to £20,000. This pay slip satisfies part one of the two-part test, because this this payslip shows that she has a gross annual salary of £240,000 when the application is submitted. And this payslip also satisfies part two of the two-part test, because this payslip shows that her £20,000 is higher than the minimum income threshold of £18,600, which applies to her application. Specified limited company income. We discussed the specified limited company definition earlier on in this video. Again, if you're still not sure whether the sponsor's employing company is a specified limited company or not, you may wish to watch part two of our three-part Common Mistakes YouTube video series, which discusses this in great detail. And we also have a comprehensive article on our website, migrate.org.uk. Most commonly, specified limited company income is included under category F. It can also be included under category G, but since category G involves a lot more paperwork, in 99% of instances, partners can completely disregard category G. To calculate the amount of specified limited company income that you can include towards a financial requirement, you must first identify the specified limited company's most recent full financial year that passed. The company's financial year can be found by looking at the CT600 company tax return document. Here is a CT600 company tax return document example. Zooming in, we can see that in this example here, the financial year starts on the 1st of April and ends on the 31st of March. So using this financial year, if an application is submitted on the 30th of March 2023, i.e. a day before the financial year ends, the relevant financial year will start on 1st of April 2021 and end on 31st of March 2022. On the other hand, if an application is submitted one day after the financial year ends on the 1st of April 2023, the relevant financial year will start on the 1st of April 2022 and end on the 30th 31st of March 2023. Because of this, it is quite commonly the case that accounts for the company need to be filed much earlier than they normally would to comply with the standard UK tax rules. The second step involves totaling the sponsor's gross employment income that was received in that financial year, as well as totaling the dividends received and declared during or in respect of that financial year. The total of these two will be the amount of income that can be included under category F if everything is evidenced correctly. Earlier on, I mentioned that the specified limited company income income can also be included under category G. The difference between category F and category G is that while category F is based on the company's most recent full financial year, category G is based on the company's two most recent full financial years. So you would simply provide documentation relating to two financial years as opposed to one, as well as calculate the mean average of the employment and dividend income figures. Non-employment income. 
Category C comprises of numerous types of income, a list of which you can see here. Unlike employment and specified limited company income, which we previously discussed, both the applicant and sponsor can include this towards the financial requirement. So for example, if the applicant earns property rental income from an overseas property, as long as that property rental income is evidenced correctly and the property rental income requirements are met, that income can be included towards the financial requirement. Other than maintenance grants and stipends, the general rules for these different types of income is to include the gross amount received in the 12 months before submitting the application. Let's now discuss relying on cash savings for UK fiancé visa applications, which is included under category D. As is the case with all partner visa applications, the cash savings here can be either cash savings of the sponsor and or applicant. If, as is more commonly the case, the minimum income threshold is £18,600, you will need more than £18,600 in cash savings. This is because there is a particular formula that you must follow to convert the cash savings into an equivalent gross annual income figure. Step 1. Identify the lowest amount of cash savings held or will be held at one point in time in the six months before submitting the application. If you're relying on cash savings held in only one bank account, simply identify the lowest figure as seen in the statements. If, however, you're relying on cash savings held over numerous accounts, if it is not clear after a quick look at the statements that the total amount held is above the required amount, we would sometimes recommend creating an Excel sheet, which will help the Home Office caseworker, as well as yourselves, identify what this figure is. Most banks allow the statements to be exported into Excel format, which will save you a ton of time creating the Excel spreadsheet manually. And if the cash savings are not held in British pounds, the cash savings will need to be converted using the conversion calculator found on www.oanda.com based on the conversion rate on the date that you submit the online application by paying the Home Office fees. Step 2 will require you to minus the figure in step 1 by £16,000. In step 3, the final step will require you to divide this number by 2.5. Once you've done this, the result will be the cash savings gross annual income equivalent figure that can be included in the financial requirement. Just to give you an idea of the amount of cash savings required, here is a table which shows the required amount of cash savings required. Here, you can see that if no dependent children are applying, £62,500 cash savings is required to have been held for six months, while £72,000 cash savings will be required if there's one dependent child who is also applying as part of the fiancé visa application. So, as with most areas of the immigration rules, there are numerous caveats to what we have discussed. For example, if some or all of the cash savings are a result of selling stocks, shares or property, the calculation, as well as the amount of time in which the cash savings needs to have been held, changes. For more information about cash savings, we have written a comprehensive guide on our website, migrate.org.uk. We may also create a YouTube video specifically discussing this, so feel free to subscribe to be notified when we do so. So, we've discussed categories A, B, C, D and F. Let's now discuss pension income, which is included under category E. The first thing to note is that both the sponsor and the applicant can include pension income towards the financial requirement. The calculation of the amount of pension income that can be included towards the financial requirement is rather simple. Simple. It is the gross amount that is being received when you submit the application if the pension income has been a source of income for at least 28 days before the submission of the application. It is not the total gross pension income received in the 12 months before submitting the application. I recently received an email from someone who purchased our DIY application pack service who was not sure what the difference was between the two. So I'll quickly explain this here. Here you can see that the person started to receive £1,000 a month in pension income two months before the submission of the application. Since, when the online application will be submitted, the person will be receiving £1,000 a month in pension income, the amount of income that they can include towards the financial requirement from pension income will be £12,000, which is the relevant equivalent gross annual income figure. The relevant figure here will not be £3,000. We will now discuss the sponsor's self-employment income as a sole trader, partner or franchise. Only those self-employed as a sole trader, partner or franchise are considered to be self-employed in the immigration rules. If the sponsor owns a limited company and pays themselves a salary and or dividends, that income will normally fall under the specified limited company category. It will not be considered to be self-employment income, since self-employment is only those who are self-employed as a sole trader, partner or franchise. To calculate the amount of income that you can include towards the financial requirement, you must follow the following steps. Step 1. Identify the most recent financial year that passed. For sponsors who 
who are self-employed in the UK, the most recent full financial year that passed will be the most recent 6th to 5th of April self-assessment tax return period. For example, if the application is submitted on the 4th of April 2023, just before the financial year ends, the relevant financial period will be the 6th of April 2021 to 5th of April 2022. On the other hand, if you apply on the 6th of April 2023, just after the financial year ends, the relevant financial period will be the 6th of April 2022 to the 5th of April 2023. Two points are worth making here. Firstly, the UK tax rules require the self-employed person to submit the accounts much later than what the immigration rules do. Therefore, if you apply shortly after the 5th of April of any given year, even though HMRC will not require you to submit the self-assessment tax return, the immigration rules unfortunately do. Secondly, for self-employed persons outside the UK, in other words, their tax resident overseas, the relevant financial year will change depending on the taxation system in the country in which they're deemed to be self-employed. Furthermore, sponsors who are self-employed overseas when the application is submitted will also be required to show that either 1. Their self-employment is ongoing and will be continuing in the UK or 2. They have a job offer of salaried or non-salaried employment in the UK starting within three months of their return. The second step will be to identify the gross taxable profits from the sponsor's share of the business in the relevant financial period, not including any deductible allowances, expenses or liabilities which may be applied to the gross taxable profits to establish the final tax liability. Now this figure, which will be the amount includable under category F, is not something that's always immediately clear, largely due to the Home Office's definition of gross taxable profits, which does not include deductible allowances, expenses or liabilities. So the best person to ask regarding what this figure is will be the sponsor's accountant. Self-employment income can also be included under category G. However, it's quite rare for partners to rely on this category since this will rely on the two most recent full financial periods, which unnecessarily complicates things for most. So in this video, we have discussed the sources of income that can be included in the financial requirement. Let's now discuss the sources of income that cannot be included in the financial requirement. One, the starting point is that income from benefits cannot be included in the financial requirement for UK fiancé visas. This is the case unless the sponsor receives one of the following benefits, whether they receive it on behalf of their child or not. As we've previously discussed, if the sponsor does receive one of these benefits, the adequate maintenance test applies, which will only require you to show that your weekly net income, minus housing expenses, is greater or equal to the amount of income support an equivalent British family of your size can receive. Importantly, the minimum income threshold of £18,600, higher if dependent children are applying, will not apply. We have written a rather comprehensive guide on the adequate maintenance test on our website, migrate.org.uk, so if the sponsor does receive one of these benefits, you may decide to give that a read. Two, credit card facilities and loans cannot be included towards the financial requirement. So the immigration rules makes it clear that you cannot borrow £62,500 from a lender and then rely on that as cash savings to satisfy the financial requirement. Three, in nearly all applications, third parties, in other words, people other than the applicant or sponsor, cannot sponsor the application just because the financial requirement is not met based on the permitted sources of income that we've already discussed. For example, a wealthy friend or family member cannot simply write a letter stating, please see my attached bank statement showing an income of £100,000 per year and cash savings of £2 million. I'm happy to sponsor the fiancé visa application. As is normally the case in the immigration rules, there are exceptions to the rule that there cannot be third-party sponsorship, however. One commonly relied on way to satisfy the financial requirement is for a friend or family member to give gift but not loan cash savings to the applicant and or sponsor. For example, on the 1st of January 2023, the sponsor's father gifted the sponsor £62,500 by transferring it to the sponsor's bank account. On the 1st of July 2023, six months after the date that the cash savings were gifted, the sponsor submitted the application. Since the sponsor's personal bank statement showed that the sponsor has held the cash savings for six months and that the cash savings did not fall below the required level of £62,500, the financial requirement will be met, if the application is evidenced accordingly. An exception to the rule that there cannot be third-party sponsorship will apply if there are exceptional circumstances which could render refusal of the application a breach of Article 8, because it could result in unjustifiably harsh consequences for the applicant, sponsor or a relevant child. It must be stressed, however, that this is an incredibly high threshold, and it is most commonly the case that this very high threshold will not be met. So that was a discussion of what can and what cannot be included in the financial requirement, and how permitted sources of income are generally calculated when it comes to the 
the financial requirement. The word generally is used because there are, unfortunately, many caveats that apply to the financial requirement. For example, when different sources of income are combined, the calculation can change. Where maternity, paternity, adoption or sick pay is received, this can change the relevant period, as well as the calculation and required documentation. When income is received in cash, as opposed to a direct bank transfer, this can result in only the net amount of income being includable towards the financial requirement, not the gross amount as is standard. All sources of income cannot be combined. For example, self-employment income and cash savings cannot be combined. Cash savings does not always need to be held in cash for six months prior to submitting the application, if additional requirements are met. And whilst employment income under category A and B ordinarily requires the person to be employed when the application is submitted, there is no such requirement for sponsors who are based overseas when the application is submitted, as they do not necessarily need to be employed when the application is submitted. There are loads of points such as this which we discuss on our website, migrate.org.uk, and we can elaborate more on these in future YouTube videos if we see that people find these videos helpful. The financial requirement is one of the many mandatory requirements that you must meet when you apply for a UK fiancé visa. For a detailed account of all of the fiancé visa requirements, you can watch our in-depth fiancé visa requirements YouTube video. Also, if you found this video helpful, feel free to let us know in the comments by liking the video and by subscribing.